So my name is Castile Hightower. I am the sister of Herbert Hightower Jr. who was shot and killed by Seattle police in 2004 while he was experiencing a mental health crisis. Um, right now we are at the federal courthouse in downtown Seattle um, getting ready for the hearing um, in regards to the consent decree that Seattle police are under. Um, we are here to demand that the consent decree end, um, not because it's been a success, but because it's been an utter failure. It's failed in holding Seattle police accountable, and it's failed in providing resources to victims of police violence and their families, so much so that um, there's been a lot of obstruction in regards to the Affected Persons Program. That's a program that was passed, uh, legislation was passed for a work group to examine uh, resources for victims of police violence, such as burial and funeral expenses, mental health services, child care and travel costs. And that's been obstructed by the CPC, the OPA, and other elected officials um, as we you know, continue to try to gain some level of accountability for the harms and brutality that we uh, face by Seattle police and um, uh, by Seattle police in our communities. What outcome are you expecting to happen today? Well, um, I did write to the federal judge to, act, to at least ask him to consider the uh, experiences and the voices of people who have been directly impacted by police violence. Um, we've experienced a lot of silencing by the CPC um, who are trying to make it seem as if they're the ones that are representing the community when they've all but silenced the community. So basically bringing light to the fact that Seattle police have not done a good job. They are not a model department. Um, and that we should end the consent decree, but only because it's been a, a failure, but not a success, um, and because it's obstructed accountability in Seattle. So it's a mixture of a few things. We're calling for um, community, uh, democratic, community control of the police in place of the consent decree that also centers the voices of those who have been directly impacted by police violence. So continuing to ask for things such as the APP, um, continuing to ask that the CPC no longer obstruct um, the, um, success of the affected persons program. So it's, it's a little bit of a, of a layered conversation that we're trying to have, just basically pu pushing back against the rhetoric that Seattle police have done a good job, that the consent decree should be lifted because they've done such a good job, but rather that, you know, the consent decree has not been something that has helped with police accountability. It hasn't helped with resources for victims and families. And so we're basically trying to bring light to that, to ask that, you know, Almost 11 years have passed, $200 million have been spent. We still have no accountability. We still have no resources for people who have been directly impacted. Uh, police officers continue to kill people. They continue to brutalize people. And we see no justice. We see no end in sight if we continue under this particular system. So in place of that, we're asking for community control of the police and we're asking for that to be centered on the voices and the experiences of people who have been directly impacted. It's a layer of conversation, it absolutely is. Um, being someone who's been and the meetings for the CPC, um, realizing how obstructive they are to the voices of people who have been directly impacted. Um, someone who has tried to work with the OPA, the Affected Persons Program was put initially under the OPA and they continue to obstruct it. They had um, what we would say would be a secret meeting or an unofficial meeting where they uh, gathered people who weren't affected people um, and discuss the affected person program, um, wanting to discuss to the cap on how many people that should be in the affected person program, um, wanting to define what an affected person is. Um, when those things have already been clearly defined through multiple conversations, through legislative intent, through public comment. So there was no reason for us to even have those conversations. Um, even because the, the affected persons program was created for affected people and was supposed to be led by affected people. So the fact that they wanted to meet without affected people was a slap in the face and was a continuation of the obstruction of the affected persons program. Um, just continuing to deal with um, the appeals process that the affected persons program. You need to stop bullshitting. You should read this one. Oh. Um, so the affected persons program included legislation for um, an appeals process, which the CPC was mandated to have in 2017, uh, six years ago, and they still didn't move on it. They still didn't do anything for it. So when the 2020, um, all of the 2020 uh, brutality happened, people who were victims of police violence, they didn't have any other place to go outside of what, with the, with, what the decisions that were made by the so-called so accountability system. So um, the decisions were made that, you know, dismissed it or uh, minimized it, then victims of police violence didn't have any place that they could appeal those decisions. 
So us seeing that, us seeing the fact that we needed resources for victims of police violence, uh, we put that all under the same legislation. When that happened, the CPC then thought it was a good idea to continue to obstruct the affected persons program. You know, then they wanted to start the, appeal, the appeals process after waiting six years after not doing it. Um, we did see that as a way to undermine the program um, because they had six years and they still didn't do it. And it, it wasn't until legislation was passed for the affected person program for affected people to decide what's going to happen to our complaints. Um, that was when the CPC decided to come in and, and start process and start looking at it. One of the first things that they did was talk about how it couldn't have been done because of spa contracts, which is incorrect. So for me, I was looking at it, um, they were not only trying to obstruct, I'm sorry, they were not only trying to undermine the affected persons program, but they were also um, trying to destroy the appeals process before even, it even gets off the ground, before they're even able, able to, you know, I guess you could say, really examine it. They were already dismissing it. Um, so us seeing that and, 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 and seeing how, how frustrating that was because the conversations that the CPC are having with the appeals process, no affected people are in the room. There's no, there's no affected people that are speaking to them in regards to how this appeal process is going to work, what it's going to look like. And this has been a pattern of theirs, of them not allowing affected people to have a voice, even though they're supposed to be the ones that are supposed to be empowering the community, uh, empowering affected people, just completely acting the complete opposite. So, so who are they interacting with if they're not uh, interacting with affected people? Seattle Police are one of, the, one of the main ones. They had the, I think it's um, before the badge program that they had there. Um, during one of their community engagement meetings, they had Seattle Police come out and talk about their training programs. Um, they had, uh, sh I think, shot spotter presentations. Um, uh, they had another presentation with another type of police tech. And this is all, you know, the community are, are, are coming out saying that these type of things they don't want in their communities. They're seeing how, you know, shot spotter has been um, used as a way to continue to surveil black and brown communities, surveil already marginalized communities. Um, seeing how that's led to deaths, led to the police being falsely be, uh, be brought into communities and that leading to a 15 year old being killed um, in Chicago, how that left to people being pushed into the carceral system unjustly uh, and being harmed in that way and the CPC completely ignoring that. So they've been, instead of talking to the community, they've been talking to the police. Or they, uh, for my opinion, they've been talking to um, groups that aren't affected people. And, it, you know, they've been talking to small business owners, like they had small business owners to come out and do a presentation in regards to that. And we've been having conversations with them to ask that we at least come and talk to them about the affected persons program. At least talk to them about some of our, some of the things that we feel like they're failing in, some of the ways that we feel like they're not giving the community a voice. And when we try to do that, such as the February 14th meeting, they had a community engagement meeting, one of the first that they had, and I think in a while that it was in person. And we came and we tried to speak to them about some of the things that has been going on that we feel frustrated about, where we feel like our voices aren't being heard, we feel like we're not being listened to, the lack of accountability after Janavi Kandula was killed, um, the lack of accountability when the Capitol Hill black teenager was surrounded by Seattle police officers and almost killed himself. It took the community coming out to save his life. Us coming to them and speak to them about these issues, when we did that, for me personally, they took the mic out of my hand and wouldn't allow me to speak. They, th they took the mic in the middle of me, me speaking and um, then turned to the people who were there and misrepresented me and misrepresented why I was there, trying to say that the only reason why I even came out to speak was because my brother was killed by Seattle police, when the reason why I was coming out was because of people like my brother to talk about the failings of the CPC and to talk about the failings of the accountability system under the consent decree. So I am an affected person. I have had a loved one ripped from me, but I'm here for the community. I'm here for people like my brother and I'm here for voices like, my, like myself to get some level of accountability under this horrible system. Who created the legislation? So myself and Dr. Howard Gale, actually, and along with um, the legislative aide from Councilmember Mosqueda's office, Melanie, uh, and I, I believe we, we had spoken with um, CM Mosqueda as well in drafting the legislation. So it was, uh, the idea came from myself and, Howard Gale, and Dr. Howard Gale. For me personally, it came out of my family being um, pushed through the system, having to deal with the bureaucratic processes after my brother was killed and that adding a whole other extra layer of trauma. Uh, and not really feeling supported by the community as we did, but feeling as if, you know, because this is a city employee who killed my brother, there should be some level of accountability or some level of empathy that the city sh ought to give to my family um, after we've experienced such a loss. At the very least, 
um, helping to assist in paying for burial and funeral expenses after a city employee killed my brother while he was experiencing a mental health crisis. So out of that whole experience and out of the added trauma that came from that experience, I felt that it was urgent, along with the continuation of the lack of accountability that has been happening with Seattle police, along with the continued killings under the consent decree, where that's Terry uh, Caver, Derek Hayden, Charlena Lyles, um, John T. Williams, on and on it goes. The lack of accountability that has been that has not been following from um, when it comes to those uh, killings um, and just seeing the ways in which that affected uh, affected families have to compete to, to a certain extent to get some level of resources, whether it be uh, the ones that are have experienced the trauma more recently or those of us that have been experiencing this trauma for 20 plus years, like my family, still trying to get some level of accountability, us being put in competition with each other uh, because of the lack of resources. So from that experience was, along with learning about um, an Ontario, Canada program uh, called Affected Persons Program that has been running for about 10 years, that um, Governor Inslee, he had a task force for police accountability. I think it lasted for a couple months uh, where they uh, examined the Affected Persons Program in Ontario, Canada. And there's like at least, um, there's a couple hours of tape on the Washington TV uh, website. Um, where they, they go into a lot of detail, so learning about it that way, um, continuing to do research on it. Myself and Dr. Howard Gale then brought that idea to the Seattle City Council initially by way of public comment, and then when we were able to speak to different uh, council members such as uh, Council Member Herbold, um, I think we also spoke to uh, Council Member Skater as well, of course, and I think there was one other council member, I think it was Council Member Juarez, I could be wrong, so I apologize. Um, so we, we, we brought that idea, you know, uh, to these other, to, to these council members, specifically council member Mosqueda, and she was able to help us draft the language. We, we, gave, we, we gave, gave draft language and then we kind of worked together in collaboration with the final language that was then put forth on the, on the budget. So since that was created by Seattle City Council, mm -hmm. with your guidance, uh -huh. um, why isn't the council enforcing? That's a good question. So initially it was under the OPA, um, that was not something that we wanted, but that was something that Councilman Mosqueda wanted. So it was under the OPA, um, and that was where it was supposed to stay. Um, but then the obstruction happened and we didn't meet. Like we still haven't had an official meeting for, I think it's almost six months now, we're almost in June. Um, so because all of that obstruction was happening, we were being prevented from having an official meeting by the OPA. Um, we then asked the council to move it into general, uh, under the general Seattle City Council. And that's what they did. Unfortunately, we've been given reasons such as um, they're waiting to hire a program manager. That was one of the reasons that they kept giving us as to why we couldn't meet. Mind you, we've $50,000 were allocated specifically to this program for this year, another 50000 for next year. Um, and we've had almost six months. I feel like that's more than enough time and money to have at least hire a program manager for us to have met at least four to five times by now. Um, so we kept getting that, that excuse. When it was transferred over to the city council, we continue to get that reason as to why they haven't, we haven't met yet. Um, another issue was the ways in which they were gonna reach out to other affected people. We gave them names of affected people that we knew were interested. And that became a conversation of whether or not they want to even include those affected people, whether they feel like that's gonna cause some kind of friction with other affected people we reach out to. Mind you, I've been making it clear and other people who have been in this coalition have been making it clear that all of these, like those type of questions don't do anything but slow down progress. And it's not really the type of questions that should be getting asked. The type of questions that we should be getting asked are, you know, um, one, what's the, what's the day that we start? Uh, two, how do we reach out to affected people? Um, the best way to reach out to affected people uh, that one, that, we, that I've already expressed interest uh, and two, you know, just getting, getting, uh, getting the ball rolling to reach out to affected people. Uh, we had asked that the OPA be used, that um, the information that the OPA already has in regards to complainants, we were given access to that. For me personally, there really is no other reason that we should be holding this all up. We have the names, we have the people that we want to reach out to. We should be doing that. There shouldn't be more conversation of, well, should we include this person or should we include that person? The only um, boundary should be, are you an affected person or not? And that should be it. So we've been getting issues with, you know, um, them trying to, uh, unfortunately, you know, figure out who an affected person is, who's an affected person isn't, even though we've made that clear. Um, hiring a program manager, that's been one of the things that's been slowing it up. That's that they're saying. Um, 
we have asked that we actually present in front of the CPC to at least have it on record for them to vote as to whether or not they're going to pursue the appeals process rather than having all of these backroom conversations and to at least present to them what the reason was that we put it under the affected persons program in front of all of the commissioners in front of full quorum and you know we weren't able to do that they you know the seattle city council just said that they were just going to go ahead and allow cpc to take it over so i mean the latest reason if i were to just say that what the concrete reason is as to why we haven't met yet i would say i don't really know to be quite frank because the reasons that i'm being given don't completely add up to me personally um, we've already made it clear through the legislative intent through conversations what an affected person was Oh, I'm sorry, what an affected person is. Um, we've already given them a list of affected people who are interested in, in being a part of the program. We've already said, okay, and this is another way that we can also grab other affected people through the complaint uh, process that the OPA has, not through the OPA, but through a list that the OPA can provide to us for complainants. Um, and then also just by reaching out to the community the ways that we've had continued to do so. So, you know, um, I, I, I really don't know exactly wh why we haven't met. And that's part of the frustration, you know, is the, the not knowing. And then things like, you know, the OPA director going ahead and having an unofficial meeting, asking how many affected people should be in it. It just, it's, it's really frustrating. And if, it feels like, you know, a, a, a lot of bureaucratic mess that is so unnecessary that could be providing potentially life-saving resources to people that need it. You know, all of this bureaucratic tape, all of this bureaucratic mess, it's, it's, it's just, it really feels like it lacks a level of empathy um, and a level of care that affected people deserve. Um, and I, I just feel like that's just a, um, a pattern of behavior that the city has exhibited, um, which led us to even needing an affected persons program to begin with. The fact that there's a, a double standard in regards to like, who does the city care about when it comes to mental health? You know, when someone's in a mental health crisis, you know, who does, the, who does the city care about when it comes to people who have experienced gun violence, you know, or even brutality or even some level of violence? And it always seems to be there, there is an exception when it comes to people who have um, experienced that violence by the hand of uh, city employees, you know, a.k.a. Seattle police uh, officers. So, so what's your, your vision for uh, a democratic solution here? I think for me, um, I want to work with other people who are already doing that type of work in Seattle and make it be a collaborative effort rather than just pointing to one particular thing or another thing. If anything, this is a way to, you know, ask, draw people in to have that conversation. We do have something, um, a, a draft of information already on seattlestop.com. Um, however, the way I look at it is I, I want to use this as a way to call people in and ask them, hey, let's have a conversation about what democratic community control of the police looks like. Let's work together to draft this legislation to make sure that people, you know, who feel very passionate about this can have a voice. Um, just far too often, we just allow the elected officials to make these decisions. You know, this is supposed to be something that's democratically elected, you know, democratically elected um, community control of the police. Let's let it be something that, you know, begins with the community, begins with a collaborative mindset, uh, begins with people, you know, from, you know, whether people who are self-identified abolitionists or self-identified harm reductionists um, to be able to have a conversation to figure out what would work best. So for me, it's, it's, it's more so we know that our current system is not working and that our current system is causing harm. Um, democratic um, community control of the police is a way that we can ha start to have that conversation to see what you know that would look like under you know community control. So that being something that not only is something that comes from the minds of the community, but also centers the needs of those uh, most impacted by police violence. Because the way I kind of look at it is, if we're going to be addressing issues in regards to police violence, let's start from the needs of those who have been directly impacted, and that is something that, and, the, and then fan out from there because marginalized communities are typically the ones who are directly harmed by police violence, people, BIPOC communities, our houseless neighbors, people who, are, who, have, um, who are struggling with their mental health, that is going to automatically overlap with a lot of the needs of the community already, whether it's mental health issues, whether it's making sure that burial and funeral expenses are paid so that people don't fall further into poverty and further into harm. And then from that, we have the conversation of 
what are some of the larger issues that the community needs? What are some of the things that, you know, uh, th that, that um, can be reallocated to the community? Um, where, so it would be typically, you know, starting from the point of view of an affected person, also, and then having that be a larger conversation to guide us to what are the larger community needs that are needed. And as we're doing that, um, also building legislation to see what it looks like to have community control over the police. There's just been so much unnecessary harm that has been done to affected people. Um, there's been so much unnecessary silencing that has been done to affected people. Um, I think it's just really important for us to understand that, you know, 2020 happened, that was a beautiful time. I'm so appreciative of everyone that came out and spoke out about it, but the fight isn't over. Um, the fight continues, we still need voices, we still need folks to come out, we still need minds to come out and have a conversation with us um, to talk about what accountability looks like, real accountability looks like, what harm reduction looks like, what abolition looks like, how do we get, to, how, how do we get there, what is the role, um, who do we need to bring in? Who, who do we need to make sure are represented and are, are listened to? Whether it's BIPOC communities, LGBTQ communities, people who are experiencing, you know, who struggle with their mental health, people who are experiencing houselessness. Who do we need to make sure are at the table so that we can have a holistic conversation about what community control actually looks like? I think this is an opportunity to do that. Um, I think that we, we definitely have, we have the community um, willpower that we can tap into um, shit, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> we <laughs> we need the community voice but we know that like from seeing what happened with 2020 that there are folks who are willing to do this work um we just need to make sure that they realize that like you know the fight continues and we still need them